episode 82. This is The Business of Architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Yes, this is your host, Enoch Sears, and today we are going to talk with Kimberly Selden, a designer, journalist, keynote speaker, and broadcast personality, but more on that in a second. In today's episode, you'll discover how to guarantee your projects are on time and on budget, the method that Kimberly Selden uses, why it hurts your business to give away free consultations, and the secret to pleasing your clients so much that they want to hire you again and again and refer others to you. Today's show is underwritten with generous support from BQE Software, the developers of Archie Office. For over 10 years, architects have relied on Archie Office to power their office and empower themselves. Go check it out at archieoffice.com. You can find recorded versions of the Business of Architecture Summit over on businessofarchitecture.com. We had some amazing feedback on the presentations, and I invite you to go over there and pick up those recorded versions to further your knowledge in the area of business so you can be running a flexible, profitable, and fulfilling architecture practice. Now, there was one iTunes uh, review that came in here. I want to read this out. I want to thank B.A. Ware is the handle here, and I, I, I'm pretty sure 99% I know who you are. Uh, B.A. Ware says, This podcast is really what all architects who run a practice need. Enoch brings to light what is working and not working by interviewing those that have walked the path before. His in-depth and insightful interviews are not only educational, but directly applicable to firms today. Oh, how I wish he was doing this years ago when I started my firm. It would have saved me lots of mistakes. I look forward to many more podcasts. Enoch, keep on going. Well, thank you very much, BA Ware. I I appreciate it, and I as well wish that a resource like this for Arctics would have existed uh, when I started out. Now, I'm going to tell you there actually is a resource that's very similar, and it's it's tailored more towards designers. And I'm going to be talking with the founder today of Business of Design, Kimberly Selden. Kimberly Selden is a designer a journalist, keynote speaker, and broadcast personality with over 20 years in the public eye. Now, Kimberly is the host of three television series, including HGTV's Design for Living. She's a design expert on CityLine and frequent guest spokesperson on HSN and TSC. Additionally, she's the editor-in-chief for Dabble Magazine, as well as the leader of an award-winning interior design build studio with offices in Toronto and Los Angeles. So, Kimberly Selden, welcome to the Business of Architecture. It's great to be here, Enoch. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It is really a pleasure to have you, and especially someone so well aligned to what we're doing over here at the Business of Architecture. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of anybody who's doing anything to help the industry that we're in succeed because most of us get uh, tossed out of school with some sort of degree, but very little knowledge when it comes to running our businesses. Well, tell me about that. Tell me about some of the deficiencies that you see, you know, going back to school, the education that designers get, and then how that sort of doesn't match up with maybe some of the things that they need to know in the in the real world, air quotes. <laughs> I had a really colorful uh, business teacher, and he, uh, he would say, uh, you know, how many are you in this uh, business to make money? And a few people would put their little hands up meagerly, and then he would say, well, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> no money here. They're just going to wear you out and the clients are liars. And so I feel like I got this edu- education in being bitter before I even had a chance to launch my business. And then, of course, they give you a contract that's like 175 years old that you can't make heads or tails of when you're reading it. And so you're, you're sort of launched into the world with very little to prepare you for really what amounts to the biggest part of the job, which is the business side. Exactly. Well, tell me about your your journey, Kimberly, to build your design build studio. And did you start working for another firm out of school? Tell me a little bit about how you let's talk. Let's focus on your design firm for the moment. Okay, so I graduated in 1991, and it was a terrible recession, and I tried very hard to get a job working for anybody, but there was simply no work. It's really not unlike the recession that started uh, in 2008, which, of course, everybody's feeling uh, still the effects of. So I did what a lot of people 
would have done. And I went into business for myself. You know, how hard can it be? Uh, and it turns out it's pretty hard. <laughs> it's pretty darn hard. And uh, I think uh, the fact that I am an eternal optimist and I'm a people pleaser actually made it even that much more difficult, believe it or not, because I did not have a set of tools to run a linear progression of a project from beginning to end. And too often I found the clients who had even less experience than I did interfering with the work process and changing their minds and second guessing me. And I, I just simply couldn't take a project from beginning to end. Uh, without a lot of painful bumps in the road along the way. And I, I really got to the point where I thought, I can't do this. I just, you know, I'll just do the TV uh, and I'll do the magazine stuff because that's lovely and people are nice to you and you get your makeup done and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then you're out in the real world with clients and it, it's tough out there. So I, I hit a very low point, I would say, about 10 years after I was in business. If you could go back and just sit down and have a small chat with that version of you 10 years previous, what would you what would you tell yourself? First of all, I would have stopped everything in my tracks and I would have found myself a business mentor, um, somebody who could teach me business. But the reality is, and I, perhaps it's not as uh, pertinent for architects, I don't know, but for interior designers and decorators and stagers, we all think of ourselves as creative people. And the business is something you have to put up with. Uh, but in fact, I now know it's a business. And I'm very lucky that a small portion of what I love to do is creative. And when I finally now have a system and procedure for running a project from top to bottom, I can enjoy the creative part because I'm not constantly battling it out with clients and, and uh, negotiating who's going to be in charge. I now know how to maintain control of the project and all that kind of stuff. So when I first started out, I would have got myself a business mentor and the next thing I would have done is I would have hired someone to answer my phone funny enough because uh, I find often uh, for interior designers, I'm sure for architects too, the clients will phone uh, the potential uh, professional and they'll begin to pick their brain over the phone and ask all kinds of questions that you're not in a position to answer because you don't have enough information. Um, and a phone call that should take 15 minutes to get someone signed up for a consultation ends up taking an hour and then some back and forth and they want to ask you one more thing because they interviewed 12 other people. So if I had to go back to the beginning, I would hire someone right up the bat to answer my phone because having done that that changed my life mm. so let's talk about uh getting a business mentor quickly did you finally go that route and get a business mentor I did because I really I was on the fence. I'm gonna I'm gonna quit working with clients because it's too hard. Nobody could have tried harder than me. I was willing to sacrifice weekends and evenings and sanity. I would have done anything to make the client and yet I was failing. So I did find somebody who had nothing to do with the interior design architecture industry, the building industry. She didn't know anything about it. She worked with banks. And she worked with big car companies. And at first I thought, oh, how is this going to work? Because it's just little me. I'm not a big corporation. Uh, but in fact, some of the principles that the big corporations use work really well for the small business order, our small business owner. And uh, we worked together um, for four or five years. And she really kind of pushed me um, to come up with a business strategy that worked. So uh, really, the, the upshot of it is this. Too many people in the industry are unable to deliver projects on time and on budget. And as an architect, I'm sure, and as an interior designer, we're thinking about the beautiful finished product, how gorgeous it is, how important it is, how, how this is going to make someone or many people, you know, in your case, how it's going to impact their life in such a positive, positive and meaningful way. And the clients are thinking about how much and when is it done. So I had to realign my thinking and start uh, creating a business that was structured around, you know, guaranteeing work on time and on budget. And that was something that just nobody did. Nobody did. And it seemed impossible. Believe me, even, even during the processes we were building it, it seemed impossible. But it, it, it worked. So I'm happy about that. And what were, what were the keys to implementing that? 
Well, it, it had to do, for me, it had to do with maintaining control of the project from the first step. So what I finally have created now is a 15-step project management strategy. And the idea behind it um, sounds a little sinister, but it's not. The idea behind it is that uh, the clients enter the relationship at step one, and there is nowhere for them to exit until step 15. It, it flows seamlessly one step to the next, and it's completely controlled by me, the person who's the professional in the relationship relationship and the clients um, actually love it. Uh, for, for so long, when a client would have a suggestion, I thought that meant you should just implement it no matter what. When in fact, the clients are just offering an opinion, but they don't, they're not an architect, they're not a designer, they're not running the show. So I had to take responsibility for pushing the project from A to B, you know, and uh, it wasn't easy. There were some bumps along the way, but we're there now. <laughs> Hey, Architect Nation, it is great to have you listening in today. I want to remind you that this episode of Business of Architecture is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice has been powering architecture firms for over 10 years and helping them to be more productive and profitable, which empowers architects to do what you like to do and what you got in this business for in the first place. Create great architecture and spaces. Go check it out at archiOffice.com. Now back to our show. Kimberly, could you give me an example of part of that 15-step process and what you mean by how this process helps you keep them on track and keeps you as the professional in the relationship? Okay, so uh, with interior design, which I, I know that there's a little bit different with architecture, but what, the way that the process works for us is I go to a consultation, which by the way, I never go to a consultation that isn't paid. It's a waste of everybody's time. Lots of people say, <laughs> oh, you show up and you see if you like each other. No, you're going to like each other. You show up for a working meeting and if you get the client to pay for the consultation, they've already invested in your business. And all you have to do for me at that point, they've already completed step one. I'm already at step two. Um, so I'm not talking to them about starting the project. I'm just talking to them about continuing the project that they've already started, which is a different thing. So that was one thing. I had to figure out um, what was what was relevant to be in the contract and what's irrelevant. And my contract is literally written for a third grader. And that's because I discovered a lot of my clients have lawyers or teams of lawyers, and I'm never going to outlawyer them. So what I decided to do instead is just talk to them in the simplest, plainest language so that in the event there's a disagreement, everybody interprets the same message and, and same reading out of the contract. So my contract's very, very simple. Um, I had to get flat the retainer, you know, how much of a retainer do I need to take? What's the formula for determining that? retainer um, and then uh, when in our process when we get to step five that's the presentation and what's very different is I used to come to the client's house and I'd show them the floor plans and the elevations and they would love it that's great and then I'd come back and I'd show them the sofas and the draperies and the and the furniture and they would love it and that's great and then I would come back and I'd show them an area carpet and a table lamp and a, a piece of art and they go well that's great but does it go with this and does it go with that and suddenly they start interfering and second guessing and they started going shopping and saying, what about this chair instead of that chair? So today what's very, very different is after um, I do my uh, inventory and our site inspection and we get all of our trades in to do a quote, the next time the clients see me, I've made every decision for their house. I literally do a turnkey presentation where every drawing is done, every piece of hardware, every toilet is specified, every piece of furniture, here's what the draperies look like and what it costs. And then all the client has to do is write a check. At that point, they snap their fingers and we just have to project manage it to the end. There's no change orders. Uh, there's no delays. Uh, and my clients, I went from having a business where I had zero repeat customers, zero referral customers, to now having 85% of my customers be repeat and uh, the other 15% are referrals. So I, I don't advertise, I don't have to advertise and I don't have to worry about where the next job's coming from, which is, you know, something that we all have to think about. Absolutely. What is the key, would you say, Kimberly, to getting those repeat referrals, uh, both repeat clients and the referrals? You know, it's, it's going to sound ridiculous, but it's finishing the job. So this is what I always say. I got about 70% of the way through, and this is my experience teaching thousands of 
designers and decorators and uh, we got about 70% of the way through and the clients would run out of money, they'd run out of patience, they, they'd run out of gas, you know, they just were done. And then eventually they would say something like, you know, we're just going to finish it ourselves. It's mostly done and we'll just finish it ourselves. And that idea of them just finishing themselves ruined it. We were not able to take photographs of it. Uh, it was not it was not polished and it didn't reflect my brand. And when their friends came over, it looked, some of it looked good, but some of it didn't look good. So who's going to hire somebody like that? So as, as pedestrian as this sounds, finishing every job down to the last piece of art hanging on the wall was really important uh, to my business. You know, I would love to get a, an outside perspective, especially from you, Kimberly, on working with architects. You know, I love working with architects. I'll, I'm going to be straight up with you because that's the only way I know how to be. I often find architects don't want to work with the designers and we have to deal with uh, a kind of a hierarchy. And I see our function as being so different that that makes me sad. I, in all these years I've been in business, I always thought I'd have an architect who would be a partner, um, which I still think would be ideal for me because there's so often things that we want to do which require an architect. So I have to go out and find somebody and they're always reluctant to work with designers. And they'll, you know, they always, I don't know, they think we make things complicated or something. I don't know. And and then the other side of the coin is designers always think that architects spend all the money before we get there. <laughs> and when I talk to architects, they say, oh, not at all. We never do. We're having a really hard time making a living. So I think the two industries stand more to gain by working together than they do fighting. And uh, I would love to see that happen. I really would because there's no reason the architect couldn't trust a professional interior designer to see his or her vision through uh, down to the last piece of furniture. And I often look at, at architectural projects in magazines, and I'm talking about residential, not commercial. Commercial is spectacular, but residential, I often feel like, oh, I just really wish I would have been able to come in there and just tweak a few things because I know it would be a little bit more comfortable for our family to live in. So... Anyway, so maybe somebody will reach out to me and say, I want to work with you. <laughs> That'd be great. Architects, listen up. Now, yeah. there, you know, what, what do you think is the, the root of this sort of cultural divide between designers and architects in terms of what you just talked about? There's definitely a hierarchy. Architects go to school longer, so I suppose that they're built in, uh, they're hardwired to to reflect the fact that they've had more education in most cases, uh, and you have to give them that. Um, and then maybe there's this idea that, um, you know, I'm putting words, it'd be better to ask the architects what they think, but I think sometimes the feeling that I get from architects is we just do things that are pretty, we just add color, when in fact a, a good interior designer is thinking about function and, and how comfortable it's going to be when they live there and is this going to have lasting value and we improve lifestyle uh, to a degree. So I, I think, as I said, I think they're kind of different we wear different hats but we need each other I hope we need each other I know some architects want to do their own interior design I don't know how successful that is I know some designers want to do their architecture I don't know how successful that is I think a nice uh, synergy would be better I agree and Kimberly what do you find because you you work with thousands as you said of interior designers and they look to you for for mentorship both personally and on a, on a larger scale what do you find to be their biggest business challenges in their own in their own businesses? You know, they, they struggle with every aspect of, of uh, the business. They're afraid to bill. They're afraid to bill for all their hours. They're afraid the clients are going to be mad. And then the first month the client gets a bill that they don't like, the client will phone in uh, with some anger and the designer will invariably say, okay, then I will take some of the bill off. And I'm always telling them, and then you're actually training your client to negotiate with you every month. You're just, it's like a dog giving them a treat after a bad behavior. Um, so they, they don't take proper uh, notes when it comes to their hours. They have no idea how long it takes them to get a job done and often it's underestimated because uh, what we do for a living is often portrayed on television as something frivolous and fun and an ex-football player could do it with a, with a hammer and a weekend and a couple gallons of paint. So I think, you know, there's, a, there's, there's too many um, roadblocks to even determine which one is the most disturbing but the fact of the matter is it's it's a lack of education around business. So lack of confidence in charging, you mentioned that, and yeah. l l reluctance to bill. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I know architects suffer that too because we have architects who are members. So, and and I've been amazed at uh, when I hear sometimes their hourly rate because the assumption from our end is that the architect's hourly hourly rate is going to be much higher than the interior designers. It's not necessarily true, and yet you have all this education and this knowledge and value that the client doesn't have and needs. So I don't want to see the architects uh, industry. Uh, suffer by a, a race to the bottom. I, I would hate to see that, and I don't want to see interior designers suffer by the same race. What kind of, you're talking about rates, what kind of rates are sort of standard? I know there's no hard and fast rule, but if you had to give a benchmark for interior designers and then what you see for architects, what well, are you seeing? Remember, often interior design is an umbrella for a, a lot of other disciplines, which are all all wonderful and I know people who are interior designers who are talented decorators who are talented and stagers who are talented I have seen everything from fifty dollars to an hour to five hundred dollars an hour um, often what happens I find is people who are at the upper end sometimes uh, say they're five hundred dollars an hour but they're not actually not billing for half of what they're doing which actually bumps their rate down to two hundred and fifty dollars an hour um, so sometimes there's not even a connection between the hourly rate and what kind of money that should be bringing in the door, if you know what I mean. Mm. So in our office, uh, I'm the principal, I'm 325 an hour, the seniors are 195, the intermediates are 145, and the juniors are $115 an hour. And that's very comfortable in the city of Toronto, and that works really well in the city of Los Angeles as well. Some people live in smaller communities, they might have to bring that number down a little bit. Um, some people don't have confidence, so they bring that number way, way down. But then, as you know, you're attracting a, a kind of client who's uh, not really looking for quality. They're looking for, you know, a task, an errand person, uh, not someone to deliver a lifestyle. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I find that <laughs> I find that in architecture, we have a rates, lot to talk about. <laughs> I know, geez. <laughs> We do have a lot to talk about, and we will pick it up in next week's episode. Uh, despite what Sean Tobin and fortunately Merrick McKeel told me, I'm going to continue to split up the episodes over the week so that you can have these in a little bit smaller bite-sized chunks. But tune in next week. Uh, we're going to take another deep dive with Kimberly. She's going to talk about how she built her business. She's going to give us the, her secret for charging higher fees. She's going to talk about the secret to getting published, and this is something I'm probably have never heard before. So if you are looking to get some PR, get published in some magazines, you definitely want to listen to next week's episode. And she's going to share actually a no-fail trick for getting into the magazine of your choice. So with that, that's a wrap. See you next week. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.